Hey, do you want to dig into the internals of how ASP.NET Boilerplate Security works? Who doesn't? I'm going to show you in this episode how to secure an external API, the one that I made in the last episode. This is going to be fun. Let's do it. Hey, and welcome to episode uh, 20, 28 of Code Hour. Uh, this is kind of a follow on to the last episode, and that one was about creating an external facing API from a regular ASP.NET boilerplate app. But in that episode, by the time we finished it, that API was not secured. There was no authentication, no authorization. So in this episode, I want to show how to add authorization to that API. And to do that, I'm going to introduce the idea of API keys. Well, it's not exactly like a new idea or anything. It's kind of a fairly standard thing. A lot of sites that offer external APIs, they have some place that you can go to their app and create an API key. And it's kind of like a user in that it has a, well, it has a, usually it has an API key and a secret. And that's like a username and a password for an account. But what's different about that from, say, a regular user account is that it's it's limited in scope. So it's a good security best practice to not give any more access than you than you need to. So these API keys, they, uh, they they only have access to get into the external API, and they couldn't, for instance, log into the regular site and create new API keys, or g uh, go in and create users, or delete data, or do the, the things that the regular site allows them to do. Also, if a user loses their API key, they could invalidate it, they could delete the API key if it got compromised while still keeping their own credentials. So they're keeping things separate. So that's what I'm going to build out in this episode. I'm going to do it in kind of three phases. The first thing I'm going to build out is the, the GUI. I'm going to build out a, a, a UI, a CRUD application for managing API keys. And, and then I'm going to build the facilities to secure a the external API. And then the third thing is I'm going to integrate it into the app that we built last time, the command line app that's accessing the external API. Sound good? Ready to get started? All right. Well, I always like to get started by thinking about the uh, the architecture and, and the design and the data structures in particular. And so in this case, I'm going to create a new class, a new data structure for an API key. And because it's so similar to a user, why not just inherit from user? So if we go over to user.cs, I'm just going to make something that's like this. And this is one of the three main pieces of security in ASP.NET Boilerplate. There are users, there are roles, and there are permissions. And users can have multiple roles, such as administrator or you know product uh, manager or something like that. And then they can have individual, and each one of those roles can have individual permissions. And the permissions are the things that we lock down classes and methods with, especially I showed that in episode 19, the Be a Hero episode, because that was how we we're going to lock down the application services. And so ASP.NET Boilerplate does all the cool hard work of figuring out who's currently logged in, what their roles are, and what the permissions are, and then mac matching those up to what are the requirements are with the ABP authorize attribute. So let's let's do it. I'm going to create a new folder in authorization. There we go. And, and that's all about we need to do for that. By the way, uh, two quick points of order. One is I'm following along with a blog post that I, this is still in preview, but I'm going to be publishing here on my blog, leerichardson.com, and this is securing external web APIs uh, in ASP.NET Boilerplate. And if you uh, want to follow along here, you can uh, follow along on this, and that would be helpful. The other thing is, a little while ago, I published a an ABP CRUD cheat sheet, which is the distilled, 
the essential steps to add an entity in ASP.NET Boilerplate with Angular. So the, uh, the idea behind this blog post is that I wanted to give just sort of like a quick reference that you could go to and follow along and make sure you haven't missed any steps because there's a lot of different steps to creating that whole crud element of ASP.NET Boilerplate and it's wonderful once you're finished because you have so much ability to customize things but it's easy to miss a step along the way. There's a lot of different things. And their documentation is great on ASP.NET Boilerplate, but what I want is I often just want like a quick checklist that I can go through. And so I'm gonna go and follow along on this blog post here in the video. So we've done step A1, we've added an entity. And so I, you know, I put in some here notes here, like do we need full audited, a soft delete creation, I must have tenant foreign keys required, do we wanna do any of these? We don't wanna do any of that because there aren't any real columns that we need. The user gives us everything that we need. So uh, don't forget to add it to the database context. So we're going to have to go over to the LeastoreDB context. And this needs to be plural, it doesn't need to be, but that is what Entity Framework Core reads to figure out what the table name should be. So that is, that is important to get that correct. I'm going to add a migration, uh, and the blog post I noticed uh, I li list a way to do that in both Visual Studio and if you're on a Mac, how to do that at the command line. I'm just going to do it here. I had done this earlier, but notice that I set the default project up here to Entity Framework Core, and I had to do that. I mentioned to do that in here. So what's this doing? Check this out. It's adding a new column into the ABP users table called discriminator. Well, that's not what I asked it to do at all. I was expecting it to create a new database table. Well, the reason that it's doing this is because Entity Framework Core, when it sees inheritance, it defaults to a type of inheritance called a table per hierarchy, which uh, the, the database, the, the DBA in me hates this type of inheritance structure, but it's, it's what we get. And basically it, it tries to put all of the, if you have like four different uh, table uh, classes that all inherit from one, it tries to put all four of those, and if it's a non-abstract base class, the fifth, the base class as well, it tries to put all of those into the same database table. And how does it figure out which of these it actually is? It uses a discriminator column, which is a string. It's just kind of like a magic string. And whatever that string happens to be is the type of the entity. And so when Entity Framework dehydrates something from the database table, it figures out, it looks at the discriminator column, it figures out what type it is, and then it figures out which columns it needs to hydrate. And one of the things that I don't like about that personally is that if I have a required, if I were to go into my API key and have a required field there, it would be non-required in the database because there's no way for Entity Framework to uh, to enforce that for non-API keys, for users. It, it couldn't be required. So that is what it is, and, and hopefully they'll add, they'll add the other type of inheritance uh, at some point in the future. Okay, so we're gonna, a discriminator column. So if I were to run this migration right now and run my site, and I've done this, <laughs> it's a pain, I got debugging it, it wouldn't work. I wouldn't be able to log in. I would, in fact, I wouldn't even be able to start the app, and the error would be something along the lines of, um, hey, there's no users in the, in the database table. Why is that? Well, that's because the default value here is null. So it's gonna go in and set null to the discriminator, and all of the existing users, administrators, and so forth, are gonna, it's not gonna be able to rehydrate them because it's not know what the type is to use. So two ways to solve this, I could do migration builder.sql and add a little uh, update statement like that, or I guess it's a little bit easier, we could just say the default value is user, and it needs to be the exact data type here that we want it to rehydrate into. And so the default value should be user, that should be correct. Okay, so we've added the migration. We've done it, make any modifications we needed to. We need to update the database. So I'm just gonna run uh, update database. And notice I could also run .NET EF database update. Okay, it applied my data migration. And if I went in and looked at the database right now, I would expect to see that discriminator column has been added. Let's just trust that it's working. Uh, so next up, let's add a DTO, a data transfer object. 
my data transfer object is going to look a little bit different than the entity itself because I'm going to want the API key to be in there. And when it gets rehydrated from a API key into an API key DTO, the column called username needs to go into the API key um, column. Uh, that's confusing. Let's just let's just code it. And I think it's a I think user is a long. If I were to go F12 and F12 and F12 and get all the way up to the root, I think it would be a long. It'll give me a compiler error if that's incorrect. And we want a public string API key so that we can show them all back to the, the user. We can list all of the API keys. And then we need a way when Auto Mapper is turning, it's, it's going to retrieve an API key. This is what I was trying to say here. It's going to retrieve an API key, and on that is going to be a field called username, and we need the username to go into API key. And I don't think I showed this last time in the Be a Hero. So I think I showed how to auto map from, but I didn't show how to do custom mappings. So let's get into a custom mapping. So to do that, and I can actually just copy the one that we get out of the out of the box with the user. There's a profile, user map profile. So we want a map profile. And there is some reflection that ASP.NET Boilerplate is doing to find all of the profiles. And if you go look in the module, I think that's in the, if you do look in the application module here, that's like the thing that when the, uh, when the project starts, it does this. I think we're going to find some code related to auto mapper configurators, add, add maps, whatever. This is, oh yeah, this scans the assembly for anything which inherits from automapper.profile. So, so let's create one of these profiles, and we're going to create one. I'll just copy paste for now. We're going to create a map. Let's just do a simple one for now. This is going to let's see on the first parameter is the source. So the source will be an API key, and the destination will be an API key DTO. And when we're doing that, we want to say for member the destination will be the API key up on line 12. And the source will be, we don't want to ignore this, we want up to the map from, and we're going to map it from username. There we go, we like that. Makes sense. We should put these in their own files. Keep it a little bit tidier. OK, we've got API key DTO and a map profile. And I mentioned this in A5 here. I said, hey, uh, you know, if it's more complex mapping, you can do this. So I showed that there in this blog post. We could put in some validation here, but we don't need this yet. And the reason is because this detail is just going to be for reading and retrieving, and we're going to create another one for writing data back out. Should we do that now? Uh, let's wait. Let's just hold off on that for the time being. So A6, register a permission. We definitely want a permission to be able to read and write API keys. That's granting someone the ability to get into the third-party API. So let's, let's do that. Oh, uh, it is here in the authorization provider. Display name. API keys, this is being localized, you can tell because of the L, so we need to go in and go to the XML file, and we'll add in API keys, which is like API keys. Nice. And then I mentioned in the blog post, but you should always specify this last optional parameter because the optional value is often wrong. In this case, this is saying, do we? If, if you're in a multi-tenancy world, and uh, if you haven't checked out my multi-tenancy video that I have, uh, go over all of how multi-tenancy works in ASP.NET Boilerplate. Um, but uh, yeah, just uh, for for now, know that this probably the default value should be. We probably only want this to show in tenants. We don't care about the host. Okay, that's API keys. I think. Did we do everything here? And let it XML file. Yes. Okay. Now we're going to add our app service. So the app service. Uh, we need a product app service. 
Pluralization in singular is actually really important here. It gets confusing if you don't name this consistently with all of the others. So, um, yeah, app service. And if I was a good person, I would probably add an interface, but I'm not a good person. I'm not going to show any unit testing in this video. I would love to do a whole dedicated session to unit testing and integration testing. It is something I personally care a lot about. And if you're watching my videos thus far, you probably didn't get that <clears throat> because I just don't. I don't show it when I'm just trying to get a concept across, but uh, I, uh, I'm generally pretty TDD. I generally write all my tests first. I'm not going to in this case, so deal with it. <laughs> all right, uh, we need an ABP authorize. Yep, that's that's a good point. Okay, you can only get to anything in here if you have the pages API keys permission. And this is going to be a CRUD app service. And we've got to get all these parameters right. Let's see. The entity will be the API key. This first parameter is the one that we're pulling back data to the website, the read, the read version. Oh, yeah. And so then the last parameter here will be the one that we're going to send data in and when we when we create new API keys. So we want to be able to send in, when you create one, we're going to want to send in a secret versus when you pull it back, we don't ever want to get that secret back ever. So we're going to have two separate DTO objects in this case. So this one is going to be the create API key. Create API key DTO, which inherits from API key DTO like that and it's going to have our secret and this is the point at which we want to do a little bit of a validation like this is definitely a required field here and uh, when because this inherits from this then we should probably go ahead and put validation on this too API key when it's being sent in will be required the API key and the secret will be required one of the things I love about ASP a boilerplate is it's going to validate those as soon as they get sent in on the server side I don't have to write any code to do that validation it just automatically does that validation for me before it even gets into any of my code and uh, let's take a look at user and see if user has any other attributes on it that we might want to steal. Oh, there it is. Okay, required and string length. There we go. So the server will not accept any strings less than 120, greater than 128 for the password and greater than 256 for the username. That's a long username. Yeah, whatever. Okay, let's let it add any missing members probably just the constructor yeah there we go that repository we're gonna need that let's save that out I like to write all my back-end code first but sometimes I bounce back and forth at the moment I've got a pretty good idea what I want to do here when the user clicks the add button we want it to pop up a dialogue and that dialogue should say should give them a uh, a default username and password. So let's create a public create API key DTO. And this method is going to be what's going to, the front end is going to call into this one to retrieve a, like a default username and password values. And, and, and the reason that we want to do this is because the, the username slash API key it would be really nice if we could make that unique across the entire system. And then when the API the external API calls into our code, it doesn't have to specify the tenant, it just specifies an API key and through that alone, if we have it unique based on a GUID for instance, then we can just figure out what the tenant is. So we can write just a little bit of extra code and save the customer having to care about multi-tenancy at all, which I think is nice. And conveniently enough, the user entity happens to have a create random password, so let's just use that. I think in a production system, I might put a little bit more time and energy into this, to tell you the truth, because if I F12 in there, it's just making a GUID and um, just running it all together. So there's no uh, letters or numbers, and it. it's only 16 characters. It's, I mean, 16, it's, it's fine. And 
It'd be good enough. Certainly good enough for a demo. Okay, anything else we want to do? Do we want to deal with uh, creating them now? Sometimes it's nice just to see code as quickly as possible and then go back in. You want to do that? Let's, let's do that. Let's hold off on the implementing the create correctly. So I'm going to compile this and uh, run the app. See Swagger update. Rejoice. I'm ready. I'm ready to rejoice. Are you ready to rejoice? Control F5. I like to control F5 in here because it loads a lot faster than if I F5 with debugging. He says with it loading for a long time. <laughs> but trust me, it would be much, much longer if I hit F5. Okay, here we go. That's great. I'm, I'm, I'm rejoicing. There's our API keys. So now we need to update and swag. Uh, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. You should probably already know this if you've watched episode 19 or whatever it is. And when I run refresh.bat, hopefully it's going to pick up those new methods and add those into the proxy. And if I look back here, and I should see service proxy. Yay! That looks just fine. Let's register our new proxy, which we have to go into the service proxy module. Whew. Okay, <laughs> I uh, thank goodness for post editing. That took a really long time, but you didn't see it. <laughs> API service proxies dot. Now it's all fast. Update the left hand now. I think there's like a lock. I don't know. Uh, conveniently enough. In the blog post, I also sent a link over to go to Material Icons. Okay, the route that this is going to be associated with is API keys. Hmm, this is going to have us jumping right into this, which is going to be a ton of work. Thank goodness I can speed up time. Don't have to waste your time doing this. Okay, oh, that actually compiled. Goodness knows if that's going to work. Chances are slim. Don't worry about that. But I did duplicate the tenant folder, find and replace tenant within it, and, and tenant with tenant in every file name, in every folder, in every file, including the HTML and the, and the TS files. Okay, great. Uh, we do need to update the route next, so we're going to go to app routing module. Okay, that looks good. We updated the route. We're going to register new components in app module TS. Looks good. And then this section right here is in order to make sure that mo for modal dialogues. This is new, I think, since I did episode 19. This section is because we're using Angular uh, Material, and Angular Material modal dialogues are so much cleaner than the version that they have been doing. So this is a really nice cleanup. Um, I kind of did this already in line. We'll see if this works. Okay, let's compile it, run it, and see. Control Shift S to save everything, and it actually compiled successfully. I am shocked. Let's see how it looks. Logged in as a tenant, the Microsoft tenant. Okay, API keys did not show up. All right, we're going to have to debug this. Why did API keys not show up? Oh, it wasn't granted, the the admin role wasn't granted API keys by default. I think this is a new thing, this, this changed in any event. I suspect if I add that and maybe now refresh. Huh, okay, well, that worked. I guess that's good enough for now. Maybe, maybe migrations are now required and you have to add a migration to add permissions when you add a new permission. That didn't used to be the case. That might be something new in the latest version because I did update my Lee store app to the most recent version of ABP. 
Okay, anyway. Oh, wow, look at this. We appear to have a page that's called API Keys. That's, that's pretty cool. Oh, and if I click plus, it actually popped up a modal dialog. It's not very pretty, but we're not trying to make it look very attractive just yet. Yeah, that, that all looks good, okay. Let's not worry too much about the details here. Let's get that create modal dialog working. Oh, so much better. That's Alt Shift F, uh, and I think I use Prettier for my default formatter, and I do not like whatever ASP.NET Boilerplate uses as their formatter with all that like line length. Oh, it's rough. Okay. Ooh, ha, ha! This is sneaky right here. Placeholder with a square brackets. We need to get rid of the square brackets. Key, secret, good. We want to fill those values in. So, for some reason, they're my my linter. When I use a linter, it says double quotes should really be single quotes, which I'm, I'm pretty sure is right. We'll just fix all quote marks. Uh, stuff, little stuff like that bothers me. Also, it would be really nice if this were in a separate file. Uh, recommend doing that always as a default. Yeah, no, and an ng on it is where we want to call that method. So we're going to call this dot the ugh, underscore API key service. I don't like underscores there. It's just me. Dot, what did we call it? Make API key. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. That might be enough. We just subscribed to the make API key. When we get an API key back, then we're just going to set the module level API key. Let's see if this works. Hey, look at that. That looks good. Looks good, right? Okay. Now we want to actually do it. And and I think if I hit save right now, it's going to, let's just see what happens. Yeah, an internal error occurred. Take a look inside of here. Uh, yeah, a missing type map configuration or unsupported mapping. It doesn't know how to convert a create API key DTO into an API key because we didn't do an auto map to. And so I think that's why I want to leave things for episode 28. In this episode, I've shown three things, uh, at least. I've shown how to do table per hierarchy mapping in Entity Framework Core. That's, that's one. And then I've shown how to do auto mapper, custom mappings in auto mapper. Uh, that's two. And then in, in three, I've shown uh, how to use the ABP CRUD sheet sheet as a checklist to do all of the CRUD work that you need to do to be able to create a new entity. Basically what I showed in episode 19, but in a more sort of structured way. So in the next episode, I'm going to finalize securing the external API and then for sort of finalize everything that we've used so far. So I hope you'll stick with me. Check that out. Uh, to do that, uh, like and subscribe and uh, see you next time.